Welcome to Trinity Bible Church. We're halfway through the month of November now, and uh, this month we've brought our on-site services back indoors, and it's been exciting to, to be gathering in person and worshiping together here in the church building. Uh, but at the same time, it is an absolute joy for us to be able to provide an online worship experience for you and uh, to keep you connected to our church family. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm the lead pastor here at Trinity. It's certainly my hope and my prayer that this time, uh, this video would further help you consider just how great and glorious our God is and that the good news of the gospel of Jesus would uh, speak to your heart and minister to your soul today. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Um, please be sure to check out all the other links that are provided uh, right there on our website. We've sort of reformatted the design. It's, it's a cleaner, crisper look, I think, and uh, it's all right there for you on that page. So check it all out. We've got a worship playlist. We've got teaching videos for our youth and for our children. Uh, we have discussion questions for our small groups and a link to our giving page as well. So check that all out and uh, be blessed as you do so. I do want to say thank you for those of you who are watching online who have been praying for our church leadership. Um, last weekend, we spent some time away. The, the elders board took a day to uh, just get away from the kind of the usual board meeting setting, and we went to the beautiful uh, Bethesda Renewal Center, and we had a great time there, just spending some time uh, together in prayer, really listening to the Lord and seeking him in prayer, um, spent some time just encouraging one another from, from the word of God. And then we spent some time taking a look at how things are going, and, and, and really in light of COVID-19, how ministry here at the church has, has been going this year, what's been going well in these days, what, what hasn't been going so well, what are some areas to improve upon, and, uh, and then we spent some time just praying further and dreaming about the future. And uh, throughout this year, as we've had different uh, challenges and different restrictions we've been working with, uh, my mantra has sort of become, uh, be sure to plan for what you know you can do. Uh, as you're kind of thinking ahead for different ideas and opportunities, make sure you're, you're thinking through what, what you know you can do right now. Uh, but at the same time, I believe that the Lord is not telling us to give up on our dreams. We, we, we don't need to give up on the dream. And so uh, as an elders board on, on the weekend, we spent some time just really prayerfully identifying some priorities for this next year in terms of, of where to emphasize our ministry efforts, how we want to care for our congregation. And so more information will be communicated on that front uh, in the near future. So please, uh, uh, please stay tuned for that. Thank you again for praying for us. I really do believe that the Lord led us in our time together. All right, we are working our way through this November series entitled Off Stage, and we're learning to drop the act and to, to look at personal integrity. And integrity is really that, that idea of being truthful in all areas of our lives, to be truthful in everything that we say and do. And so two weeks ago, we kicked off the series looking at the integrity of Daniel. In the opening chapter of Daniel, we saw how Daniel chose to honor God. He sought to honor him by being truthful with his life and then last week, we were in the book of 1 John in chapter 1, being given that reminder to closely walk in the light. God is, God is the light, in him is no darkness at all. And so we need to be truthful with him in our own lives to confess our sin when we're aware of it. And so now this week, as we continue on here, we're going to go back into the Old Testament. We're going to go to the book of 2 Kings. Uh, so please uh, turn with me in your Bibles, if you've got a Bible there, or uh, on your devices with a Bible app. Go to 2 Kings chapter 5. And then this passage is going to help us kind of consider the importance of trust and the importance of trust in our everyday relationships. Um, we all have relationships. Each one of us has relationships of different types. There, there are these established connections that we have. And some relationships are closer than others. Some are quite tight. Uh, you wouldn't be willing to, to compromise those relationships. Uh, others are more kind of surface level. They're, they're, they're limited to specific settings or specific capacities. But, but whatever the nature of the relationship, when trust is lost in a relationship, then that, that relationship erodes. It, it will break down over time. And so today's passage, we're going to meet uh, a number of different characters, actually. Uh, but in particular, there will be one character who, uh, who serves as an example for us in terms of someone breaking trust and, and really the consequences that that break of trust brings. So, you know, you might be thinking here at the onset of things now, well, th this won't be a particularly uplifting or inspiring message if we're just kind of looking at an example of someone who, who was not walking integrity, someone who was not truthful. Um, but I will say that although, although we will certainly see our own fallen condition in this passage, uh, we will still be able to reach beyond our brokenness. We will get that glorious glimpse of our amazing Savior. And the good news of God's love, which is made known to us through Jesus, 
through the sending of, of Jesus and, and his life and work and ministry, um, that good news is still going to come to us and speak to our hearts. So I want to encourage you with that as we start our time here. So with all that said, let's, let's set the stage here. And, and what I'm going to do is actually read uh, really the first half of the chapter. I'm going to read verses 1 through 14 here in 2 Kings chapter 5. Just that kind of gives us the backstory for, for the rest of the chapter. And, and as I do that, we'll, we'll spend some time in prayer together. And then, uh, then we'll continue to work our way through the rest of the chapter. So if you're there and you're ready, I've got my Bible open and ready here in 2 Kings chapter 5. I'll read for us now, starting in verse 1, going down to verse 14. This is the word of God. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man. He was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. Verse 8. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not just wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Let's pray for this time that we have together in the Word of God. Father, we come uh, into your presence now. Uh, we, We bow before you now with a sense of of wonder and of reverence, and of awe. And I think of of the uh, opening lines, the the words from that uh, well-known praise song of many years ago, that you are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Lord, it is hard for us to fathom who you really are. We, are. we are limited creatures. We are finite beings. And yet we do believe that in your great love for us, you have revealed yourself. You have revealed yourself in such a way that we might be able to, to know you and, and to experience you in our lives. Lord, your word tells us, the Bible tells us that, that you have revealed yourself, your, your uh, invisible attributes, your characteristics have been put on display from the beginning of time through the beauty of your creation. We're told that, that all men are without excuse. And we also know from your word that there is something embedded within us, there is something intrinsically found in each one of us. There is a longing uh, for something that transcends the current reality we find ourselves. There's something that, that we seek that goes beyond our present existence. We're told that you've placed eternity within each of our hearts. And so, Lord, there is this longing within us, and we believe that that longing is placed there by you, that we might 
that we might find you and that we might know you and we might experience life to the full, the abundant life that you talk about, your, your son, the Lord Jesus, talked about. So, Father, we say thank you that you have revealed yourself through your word. We believe that to be true. Through, through the sending of your son, Jesus, the one who makes it possible for us to, to come into your presence. And so, Father, we pray, uh, believing by faith that, that in these moments we have together, that you have, have the very real power, you have the, the capacity to speak to our hearts in a way that is uh, direct, in a way that is relevant, in a way that is in, entirely appropriate for whatever we might be facing right now, whatever emotions we might be uh, wrestling with, whatever situations we might be dealing with, the decision we're, we're wrestling with, something we're struggling, an area of our lives that, that we're hiding from everybody else. Lord, I don't know the exact scenario for each one, but I do know that you are a God who is real and that you are a God who is personal and a God who desires to, to, to meet with us and speak to us in these moments. And so, Father, to that end, I pray and ask that though I am certainly a flawed individual, that you would use me in these moments to be a conduit for your power, that I would be a mouthpiece for the truth and authority of your word, and that our hearts and minds would, would be oh so ready, oh so receptive um, for the things you want to say in these moments. So Lord, we love you and we're thankful for your word and we pray that you would lead and guide this time and speak to us in a way that only you can. We ask in the name of your son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. As we're looking at personal integrity this month, it's often said that our true character rises to the surface in unusual times. In moments of, of stress, moments of, of chaos, the, the uncertain things, when life gets turned upside down, who we really are shines through at those times. How we deal with adversity and how we face our various challenges. And that's true not only in our reactions to the hard things and the negative things, but it also, uh, our character shines through in the positive things. Our character comes out in how we respond to the adulation of others, how we handle those moments of, of personal success, how we, how we process and interpret the things that happen in our favor. And this chapter here that we're going to work our way through, we've already gone through half of it, 2 Kings chapter 5, really as a whole, we're presented with a number of different people. And, and really, truthfully, for most of them, their character is put on display. A lot of people refer to this, this first half of the chapter, this first part, um, and, and they love it, and, and uh, this story of, of Naaman, he's this big shot in the Syrian army, he's a successful leader, he's a man of power, um, he's, he's a, a capable military person, we're told, um, and yet we're told in verse 2 that he's stricken with leprosy, that he's a leper. And what's amazing is that it's, it's actually one of his servants, one of, one of uh, the people who he has captured and enslaved, a, a girl from Israel who suggests that this man who ruined her life, this man who probably ruined her family, she wants to see him, she has compassion on him, she wants him to be healed. So she suggests that he would go to visit the prophet in Samaria, a man named Elisha. If you know me well enough, you know that I sometimes make reference to uh, one of my favorite translations of the Bible, which is the Jesus Storybook Bible. We have that with our kids and uh, our parents. It's a great uh, book. If you've, if you've not got a copy in your home, uh, talk to me. I'd love to, to get a copy into your hands. But in the Jesus Storybook Bible, this particular event is included among the many stories. And, and I love how it's described when Naaman travels to Israel. He, we're told in the text here that he brings with him, he's got, he's got all kinds of stuff. He's got all kinds of money and, and clothing and everything. We're, we're kind of getting the impression that he's a big spender, that he's a high roller. So he has all this. He's also got a letter from his king, the king of Syria, writing to Israel's king. And so in the Jesus Storybook Bible, it shows, uh, it says that when Naaman shows up to see the king of Israel, he knocks on the door and he says, my healing, please. <laughs> That's just kind of how he goes about doing it. He asks for his healing. And of course, the king, who uh, at the time, uh, of course, the king at the time was King uh, Jehoram, in case you were wondering who that king might have been. King Jehoram says, hey, you know, I can do all kinds of things, but healing is not part of it. That's not really in my job description, and um, I can't do that. And that's when Elisha, the prophet, gets word of what's going on. He sends a message to the king. He, he tells the king to send Naaman his way. And, and I love the reason for why he would do this. We're told right there at the end of verse 8. I don't know if you caught this. Right at the end of verse 8, he says, um, Let him come now to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. 
so I believe that, that God has gifted Elisha with, with wisdom and insight to understand that what's going on here, that name and situation, it, this is not a result of judgment, but really this is a doorway to discovery. Naaman has this sickness though, so that he might come to know the one true God, the God of Israel. So what happens? Well, Naaman and his entourage, they continue on to Elisha's place in Samaria. And notice what happens at the start. Elisha only sends out a messenger. He doesn't even bother to go see Naaman himself. Well, that's got to be a bit of a blow to the ego, right? This powerful Syrian military leader, he's told to go see someone who can heal him. He goes to the king. The king says, no, go see this prophet. And when he goes to see the prophet, all he gets is a messenger. <laughs> and the messenger says, go and wash in the Jordan River seven times. And Naaman doesn't like this idea because he has power. He has wealth. He's brought gifts. He has a letter from the king. He's expecting some sort of grand healing ceremony from this man of God in Israel. And instead, they tell him to go take a bath in the Jordan. And, and Naaman's thinking is, this is ridiculous. If it's a matter of dipping in a river, hey, our rivers up in Syria are much more clean. But it's, notice his servants. They're the ones who talk him into going through with it. And he does. And when he does, we're told in verse 14 that his flesh was restored like that of a little child. So there is a physical change that has happened with this man. He's been healed. And his heart is not too far behind. And we'll get to that shortly. But, but first, to sort of summarize the, the first half of this chapter, what we've got so far before we work through the rest of the way here, we have Naaman. He's a man of power who, when faced with adversity, his, his tendency, his approach is to just rely on his, his own strength, his own wealth. He's going to try to rely on his own might. We have his servant girl, who, rather than being bitter toward her, her master, who, who wants to see his demise, she instead has compassion on him, and she actually offers help. We have a couple of the kings, Syria and Israel. They're mostly just kind of in the background. We have Elisha. We're going to read more about him in a moment. And then we have Naaman's servants, who it should be noted, they're the ones who, who kind of talk him down off the ledge, and they say, hey, you need to do this in order that you can be healed. These are the instructions you've been given. You need to go through with this. So that's kind of where we're at. We've been given different, different types of character that are coming through here. Now we're going to read on here. I want to read verses 15 down to the first part of verse 19. Here's what it says. Then he returned to the man of God, Naaman, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So accept now a present from your servant. But he said, Elisha said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And then Naaman said, If not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth, for from now on your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any god but the Lord. In this matter may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Rimmon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. He said to him, Go in peace. So here's what's happened. Naaman is now clean. He travels back to Elisha's place. That would be about 25 miles from the Jordan River to Elisha's place in Samaria. And, and, and what is the first thing that he says? Now remember, he has not met Elisha in person yet. When he first went there, he was, it was just the messenger who went out to meet him and, and, and give him the instructions. So what is it Naaman says? Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So that is, that is a complete healing. That is a total cleansing. This, this is a profession of faith. This is a confession that God, the God of Israel is the one true God. Naaman, Naaman, are you trusting in God alone for your salvation? Yes. And, and, and out of his gratitude, he still wants to give something. He wants to, to it's, it's, not, um, it's not earning this healing now. It, it's now kind of this response. He wants to give as a response to his healing. He wants to give this gift to Elisha, and Elisha refuses it. He's saying, hey, this, one, this one's on the house. This one's for free. This is some pro bono work. And, and this is Elisha's character showing up here, I believe. He's, he's working unto the Lord, not for men. And then in verse 17, we get this request. Naaman makes this request to take a couple of loads, a couple of mule loads of Israelite soil. Now, that might seem like a bit of a funny thing to you. It, it kind of reminds me of the scene in Saving, Saving Private Ryan, where the one soldier, um, after they've landed on the beach at Normandy, they're in France, he gathers up some soil and puts it in a little uh, can, and it's marked France. And, and then you see on his, on his pack, he's got uh, uh, a can that says Italy and another can that says Africa. So he's, he's kind of collecting the dirt from the different places he's seen 
uh, action. But in reality, what's going on here, Naaman, coming from a different country, he holds the belief, as many in the ancient Middle East did at that time, that, that a god or a deity could only be worshipped on the soil of the nation to which that god belonged. So in light of his recent statement that the only god, the only true god is found in Israel, what Naaman wants to do is bring back soil from Israel so that he can then make offerings and he can burn sacrifices when he returns to Syria. And even when he goes into the place of where the Syrian god is, uh, he wants to be pardoned so that he can still worship the God of Israel. And I believe that further speaks to the transformation that's taking place in his heart, right? Not all that long ago, he was, he was making fun of the Jordan River. He's saying, hey, Syria's got cleaner rivers than this. I'll just go back up there. This place is dirty. This place is muddy. This is unfit for any sort of cleansing. But now he sees this land as precious. He wants the soil from this precious place to take back to his home country that he might worship the God of Israel. And Elisha sends him on his way. Now, we're about two-thirds of the way through our time here, but this is where our poor example of integrity now enters the scene. This is where our lesson is now going to show up. So let's read uh, the rest of verse 19 now. We'll go down to verse 24. But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, See, my master has spared this Naaman, the Syrian, in not accepting from his hand what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi followed Naaman. And when Naaman saw someone running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me to say, There have just now come to me from the hill country of Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. And Naaman said, Be pleased to accept two talents. And he urged him and tied up two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothing and laid them on two of his servants. And they carried them before Gehazi. And when he came to the hill, he took them from their hand and put them in the house. And he sent the men away and they departed. So here we go. Gehazi is Elisha's servant. Now, we're not told if he was the one who was the messenger early on, the, the one who initially met Naaman when he arrived at Elisha's place. But what we do know is that uh, upon Naaman's departure, Gehazi is seeing dollar signs. He's coveting all this wealth that he knows Naaman brought in hopes of exchanging it for his healing. Now, Naaman's been healed without having to pay anything, but Gehazi, by his own standards, he's, he's thinking, man, I got to get something out of this. I, 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 man, I'm entitled to something here. Why, why let all this loot go to waste, especially when this guy was willing to give it up? That's where he's coming from. And so he lies. He covets first, and then he lies. The, uh, the early church fathers talked about this. They talked about the three stages of temptation. The first one is suggestion, when, when a temptation first appears, and then the choice has to be made to either flee from it, to, to run away from it, or to then further entertain it. It's kind of, the, kind of the fork of the road, to run away from the temptation or to further entertain it. And, and, and the second stage, that's really what the second stage is, known as delight, the delight stage of temptation, when someone actually begins to fantasize, acting out upon their desire. They go over in their mind what it might be like to actually pursue that temptation. They visualize it, they start to covet. And then it gets to the third stage, which is ascent. They're, they are actually acting out on that. The temptation has now become sin. Sam Albury says it's much harder to physically resist a sin that you've been mentally rehearsing. Let me say that again. It's much harder to physically resist a sin that you've been mentally rehearsing. And that's so true, isn't it? The more you build something up in your mind, the more you kind of play it out over and over again, eventually you're going to want to go after it and actually act out upon that desire. And this is Gehazi here. He, he saw all the wealth. He saw all the money. He saw all the clothing on display. He sees that when Naaman first shows up on the scene and he probably starts thinking about, hey, if Elisha heals him, we're going to get all this stuff and Elisha's probably going to give me a share of this because I'm his servant. So he might have been shocked or, or disappointed or maybe, maybe flat out angry when Elisha turned down Naaman's offer of a gift. And so in this moment, Gehazi is going from coveting to now acting out. He's going to bend the truth to get there. So in verse 22, he says that he's been sent by his master. Not true. There are these two young men from Ephraim that are now visiting. They're, they're sons of the prophets. Nope, not true. 
But Gehazi knows that this will get Naaman. And, and, and Naaman, in his newfound lease on life, he, he wants to be generous. And so he immediately agrees. He, he is very up for this. He, he, and so, so much so that he, in fact, offers not just one talent of silver, but, but two. He says, hey, there are two of these sons. Give them two talents. And two talents would be about 150 pounds of silver. That's a lot of dough, right? And so Gehazi takes it. He sends Naaman's servants on their way, and he goes into the house. Now read verse 25 with me now. Verse 25 says, He went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said to him, Where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant went nowhere. So, okay, so just picture this one here. It's like Gehazi is, you know, giggling to himself. He's rubbing his hands with glee. He's excited that he's actually secured some of this wealth. And then he turns around, shuts the door, and pfft, there's Elisha right there, right? <laughs> Caught in the act. And Elisha asks the simple question. Where have you been, Gehazi? Now, in that situation, it's, it's once again a test of character. There are two ways this could go. It's a, the integrity is being put to the test, Right? Gehazi could own up to what he's done and, and just confess right then and there. But unfortunately for him, he's, he's, he's going too far down this path. He, he, is, he is given over to this temptation. It is, it is birth sin, and he is now down this path. And so he's now trying to cover his tracks. He's already lied once, and so he lies again. I don't know. I, I haven't been anywhere. I haven't been anywhere. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, have you ever been there where, where yeah, you first had to lie to go after something that you really wanted, and, and, and then once you, you got that, then you realize you're going to have to lie again to cover your tracks, and, and then again and again and again, and it's kind of this cycle of lies. And over time, what happens is that becomes quite exhausting, and, and you start to become paranoid even that you haven't, you haven't actually told the same fake story to, to all the same people. The, the story's not right with everyone, and so, so something's going to give up here, and your, your lies upon lies are just, the, it's just one big messy pile. This is Gehazi at this moment. He's gone too far down this path. And, and pro tip here, pro tip, it's probably never good to lie to a prophet of the Lord, someone who can receive divine revelation at any given moment. And you can be certain here that Elisha already knows. He's already aware of what's going on. He knows what's taken place. So let's, let's keep going here. Let's finish the chapter together. Verses 26 and 27 now. But he said to him, Elisha said, to Gehazi, did not my heart go when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to accept money and garments, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male servants and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence like, uh, he went out from his presence a leper like snow couple things to note here. One, one, you can see that Elisha is heartbroken, that his servant has been lured and enticed by greed, and, and, and that he was willing to compromise his integrity to chase after material gain. And with that, there, there's really a risk for Elisha. There's a risk that his own office as a prophet of God could be compromised. Because remember, in this time period in, in Israel's history, at the time of Elisha, um, the people were in rough shape. There were all kinds of false prophets out there. They were encouraging the people to worship foreign gods. And Elisha is one of the good ones. He's one of the few good men out there. And now there's a risk that, that his, his own integrity is being compromised. Now, his integrity was already on display. He turned down Naaman's offer for payment. He says, no, this is, this is from the Lord. But now there's potentially a shadow on him because of his servant, the greed of his servant. And the trust that existed in that relationship. We don't know how long these two have, have known each other. We don't know how long they've been serving together in ministry. But the trust in that relationship is gone because Gehazi has chosen not to be truthful. He lied. And then he tried to cover his tracks by lying again. And it all came crashing down on him. And the second thing to note here is, is really the irony that Gehazi wanted something from Naaman. He wanted some of the wealth. He lusted after that wealth, and he wanted to help himself to, you know, the silver and the clothing and whatever else. He carried the sense of entitlement to accept something on behalf of his master, even if his master wasn't willing. So isn't it ironic that in the end, what Gehazi ultimately receives from Naaman is the very skin disease that Naaman himself was cured from? God will not be mocked. God knows the heart. God sees the unseen. Now, thankfully, 
what we can see is we see just our, our own brokenness in this. We see our tendency to, to covet and to, to, uh, to then lie and try to cover our tracks and, and, and times where we break trust in our relationships. The beautiful thing is that the Lord Jesus tells us that, that we can know the truth. And when we know the truth, the truth will set us free. Jesus tells us that he is the way and that he is the truth and he is the life. And by him, we can come to the Father. He's the only one who brings us to the Father. He sees us. He sees the real us. He died for the real us. He allows us to be our, our true selves in the gospel. Because we are, when we realize our brokenness, when we realize we broke the trust of God by sinning against him, by rebelling against his good and glorious standard, by realizing that we need to be forgiven and, and, and we can't do it to, we can't earn the forgiveness on our own. It, it's got to be acknowledging what Jesus has done for us on the cross. When we come to the saving knowledge of that truth, when we confess our sin, ask God to forgive us, invite Jesus to come into our lives, there is such a freedom to know that that truth sets us free and that we can be ourselves each and every single day in a relationship with God. And so if you've never heard that before, if you've never believed that before, maybe, maybe you have heard it before and you've never really acted upon it before, today can be that day. It's a simple prayer to just say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for going my own way against you. God, I recognize my brokenness. I realize I need to be forgiven. Jesus, thank you that you did what was necessary to achieve that forgiveness, that you took my sin upon yourself when you died in my place. You died on the cross. And thank you that you rose again from the dead, showing that sin and death could be defeated and that I could be brought into a relationship with you, both now and forevermore, the abundant life to know God, not just in this life, but through all of eternity. Today can be that day if you've never believed that and, and prayed that and, and decided to make Jesus the Lord of your life. The truth can set you free. You don't have to worry about covering your tracks. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's a relief to know that you can be the true you, the real you, the way God wants you to be redeemed by him. And if you are in Christ, if you have received him, I want to ask just a few questions for us as we, as we wrap up here to further walk in the power and the truth of the gospel going forward. The first question is this, who do you need to be truthful with? Is there someone right now where, where you're just not telling the full story, you're not giving the full details, you're not sharing the full picture? Who needs to hear the truth from you? Maybe it's somebody that, uh, that is um, struggling. Maybe it's somebody who's acting in a way that you know is not honoring to the Lord, but nobody else is speaking into their life, and you need to be that voice of truth in their life right now. Who do you need to be truthful with? Another question to consider is who do you need to rebuild trust with? Again, relationships can be broken because of a betrayal of trust. They can erode over time. They break down. Who's someone that, that maybe you've betrayed that trust because you chose not to be truthful with them at some point? How might you go about restoring that trust? What does that look like? Maybe it's a phone call. Maybe it's, maybe it's a, a meeting in person at a safe distance. But, but have that conversation. Have the courage to take that step to re-engage in that broken relationship. I believe the Lord wants to, to heal you in that and, and to mend you in that. And, and on the flip side of that, maybe there's someone out there who, who has betrayed your trust. And the question would be, who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to reach out to? Maybe, maybe they're just having a hard time. Maybe they're still dealing with the guilt and shame of what they've done to you. Maybe you can be the one to take the first step. That's what the gospel of Jesus frees us to do, to extend forgiveness and to walk in the truth of the forgiveness that God has given to us. So those are just some questions for us to think about. I'd encourage you to act on that today. This is a uh, really a fun story, but we see in it ourselves. We see our brokenness. We see the joy of, of, of the transformation that takes place when we are fully healed and fully cleansed. And so whether you are feeling like you're kind of like a Gehazi right now, or you're feeling like a, a Naaman, or even an Elisha, someone has, has betrayed your trust, uh, wherever you are, I want to point you beyond them to Jesus, the Savior, our Lord and Master and King, the one who sets us free. So let's close our time in prayer together. And, uh, and then uh, we'll go on our way here. Father, we're thankful for this time. We're so thankful for your word. Lord, this is a, a story that took place thousands of years ago, and yet it is, it is so very real and so very raw for us as we consider it today. Father, we, we recognize that when we are not truthful, uh, hurt happens. Uh, we cause hurt uh, upon ourselves, certainly. We, we cause hurt to you. You are grieved by, by uh, us choosing to walk in darkness rather in the, than in the light. And we hurt others because trust is betrayed and that breaks down relationships uh, immediately or over time. So Father, I pray for each one watching 
uh, that you would help them to, to know what the path forward is, to, to walk in truth, to be truthful with those around them. Uh, give them the courage, give them the conviction to, to have a conversation. It might be hard, it might be painful, but I believe the payoff is worth it. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that, that you are the one who, who is the truth, the one who sets us free, the one who gives us uh, the new hope, the new life, the restoration, a relationship with you. We thank you for, for you being the greatest example of someone being truthful. Because more often than not, we read your words in scripture, I tell you the truth. So thank you for telling the truth to us, what we need to hear, even in these moments today. Father, we love you and thank you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Thank you for joining me here today. Um, I'd ask you to please pray for me if you think of it this week. I'm actually going to be away. I'm uh, attending a sort of a, a mini retreat, uh, small conference training session for some uh, fellow uh, pastors within the AGC, our association. There's a small group of us. We're kind of doing this intensive week-long course of, of leadership development and, and uh, pastoral training. So uh, I'd certainly appreciate your prayers, and, and beyond that, prayers for, uh, for Rachel and the kids as, uh, as I'm out of the picture. Uh, I'll be back next weekend, certainly, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, you can pray for Pastor Caleb, too, because he's going to be the one uh, preaching the Word of God next Sunday. So we look forward to being together for that and being blessed by that. Have a wonderful week ahead, and looking forward to seeing you again soon.